the introduction for our keynote speaker today, Dr. Jim Bassingthwaite. It is uh, truly a pleasure and uh, also an honor to have the opportunity to introduce uh, Jim uh, to this audience uh, because he has been uh, an inspiration to me uh, throughout my early years of my career and still is. And um, not only I admire his sharp intellect and his uh, warm personality, but also I always enjoy his original way of thinking. So like you, I'm looking forward to this uh, plenary talk. In the way of basic biographical information, which I'll try to keep to a minimum, because a lot can be said, uh, Jim uh, has had, uh, he's currently a professor of bioengineering and radiology at the University of Washington. And uh, he has had his uh, training in both uh, medicine, uh, MD from University of Toronto, and uh, and PhD in physiology from Mayo Clinic. Uh, he has been one of the pioneers in the use of the systems approach to physiology, uh, and this is where our primary connection has been. Uh, his particular interest is in uh, applying systems concepts to understanding microcirculation, and he has been uh, directing a national simulation resource at the University of Washington dedicated to that uh, subject. He has also served as chair of his department in Seattle at the University of Washington, and um, he has been honored with a number of distinctions, uh, including uh, being a member of the National Academy of Engineering, uh, being a past president of the Biomedical Engineering Society, editor-in-chief of the Annals of Biomedical Engineering, and many other honors. Since uh, obviously a lot more can be said, but I prefer to keep my remarks to a minimum by, however, pointing out one particular accomplishment and distinction which I uh, ranks very highly in my uh, appreciation of his contributions. Uh, Jim has been the person who inspired and managed to uh, implement the Physium project. Uh, about 15 years ago, I believe. Uh, this is an international effort that uh, seeks to uh, develop uh, an internet-based uh, bank of information and data that will connect uh, from the genome to the phys organ physiology uh, our knowledge. And I, that idea finds me, of course, in great approval, and this is why I would like to uh, congratulate him once again publicly, and uh, I trust that uh, some of your talk will address that issue of the Physium project. So with this, I would like to invite our speaker, Jim Bassingthwaite, to join me. Vasilis, thank you so very much for a very kind and thoughtful introduction. And I have to say it's a special honor and, and privilege to be here uh, at MB EMBS and to feel right at home in the midst. This is a special occasion for me, therefore. Um, I'm going to talk about something that's a little bit oddball, and uh, you may even I hope question it, because my thesis is that one needs to maintain your active doubt. So as I make my presentation, raise your doubting sensors and query whether what I'm saying makes sense to you. So I'm going to put, put this talk in the, in the sense of reproducibility and modeling. It's really needed that it advances the science, but there's too little of it. There's not enough reproducible papers published. So I'm gonna make a proposition for a kind of localized objective, a reproducible uh, package, a template package for reproducibility of models. Not everything, just models. And I'll give an example of a project that uses that technology. And then the discussion that follows says, is this really worthwhile? So 
errors are the norm. Um, Christensen Annie wor works works uh, with the group at Stanford, and uh, that publishes the biomedical computation reviews. And she made a review which said, "Oh, there are errors in data, in software, in the methods. They're not just typos. They're all sorts of things." Okay. Part of the problem is that the models that people write about, talk about, present in journals, uh, discuss in the society meetings, are not reproducible. So, our repro so our, if they're in journals, then our uh, review system has failed. We need to do something about it. Here's one kind of example. Um, one, of, one of Peter Hunter's heritages, heritages is a really nice group uh, coming out of Auckland, New Zealand. And Nick Smith and Steve Niederer put together a, an analysis of model phylogeny. Models are based one upon another, and errors propagate in these phylogenetic systems. These, this system, I'll enlarge it a little bit. Here's an, here's an example just of the sodium-potassium pump, and uh, derived from uh, early models, the actual data shown on the right panel as the squares comes from Nakai and, uh, Nakao and Gatsby, and then there are various models that derive from it. Um, the species are given uh, by the, in, the, in the red uh, ovals. They come from the dogs, guinea pigs, humans, sheep, and the models are in the, in the squares, and they all differ somewhat. You can see that on, in the right panel, only one of the models, that of Luo and Rudy in 1994, actually fits the data from, from Nakao and Godsby. And the others are approximate, but don't fit it. The range of data there, uh, the highest line is for an internal sodium of 1.5 millimolar, Oh, much too low. The, the bottom line is for an internal sodium of 50, much too high for physiological reasoning. But the other models don't, the, the other models don't fit specific data. Then you ask the question, are those guinea pig data representative of the other species? Most particularly, are they representative of what, where we want to apply it to human disease? We don't know. So the physiome projects that, that, uh, uh, um, that the Vasilis has, has, has mentioned really depend on reproducibility. If we're going to build one stage upon another, uh, we need to have things captured nicely so they can be reproduced and built upon, not guessed about. So the models, they need to be descriptive, they have to be theoretical, and yet mechanistic, and they're designed to represent the ideas or our status quo feeling about what the real system is. So it's a representation. Primary in our thinking about modeling is all models are wrong in the sense of either being really wrong, incomplete, inexact, incomplete, and are doomed to be changed. So they're transient description of a, working, of a working hypothesis and, and a way of thinking about it at the moment, and it won't last. So the data that go into making the models and the models themselves become a complementary matched set. A new set of data will reveal new problems. The models are just transients evolving projections and perceptions. One of the things that is pushing us to reproducibility is the considerations of NSF, and NIH is following in its stead. I put this particular uh, statement from NSF out in front of you because it's a statement of expectations on, uh, of the funding agency. NSF expects significant findings from research and education, uh, educational activities it supports to be promptly submitted for publication 
with authorship that re accurately reflects the contribution of those involved. It expects investigators to share with other researchers the data, samples, physical collections, and other supporting materials created or gathered in the course of the work. It also encourages grantees to share software and inventions or otherwise to make the innovations that they embody widely useful and usable. Hmm. So that philosophical statement, I would encourage in the last phrase to say, expects grantees, not just encourages, because after all, the goal of science is to create something that can be used as a stepping stone for the next experiments. Data replication and reproducibility is the subject of a science uh, a collection uh, last year. The first paper on computer science by Peng uh, points out how seldom uh, or maybe even never uh, computational science papers are are found to be reliable. He points this out because uh, as uh, Buck Buckheit and Donahoe put it in, in earlier years, uh, the presentation of a computational science uh, result is, um, is simply advertising unless it is accompanied by the full set of computations the data that went into it, the results of that computation, the methods that were used for the computation, and the sources publicly made available. That almost never occurs. And he was using it as a way of saying that computational science is not very well developed compared to some other sciences, but the problem is this occurs in all sciences. It's hard to reproduce. Behavioral research and computation, biology, field biology, mm. systems biology, the omics, these are all difficult to deal with. One of the success stories, though, uh, is on global warming. This last article, the reproducibility of, of observational estimates of surface and atmospheric temperature change. This was a huge effort over some years in order to get different groups to reanalyze the data and came to the conclusion firmly that the global is actually warming. So this had big political implications, and, uh, but it took a lot of years to, to, and a lot of effort in order to bring those ideas together. Sci Scientific American has said, oh, this is in tune with what we expect in modern day and age, collaboration, cooperation. The NIH has encouraged this with PO1s uh, through the research resource thing, um, through P51s and now UO1s as collaborative grants, multi-institutional. So these are uh, the creating the development of a thinking on comprehensive collaborative programs that, that go beyond one's own lab. E.O. Wilson, a biologist, had a good way of looking at this. He labeled this, this idea of bringing things together, consilience. He, he didn't use the word collaboration or, or um, convergence, but consilience, uh, where he was trying to talk about the interactions between uh, work and ideas in different fields. And he, he derived the term from William Rule, who said, it's a jumping together of knowledge by the linking of facts and fact-based theory across disciplines. Hmm. So what's a fact? The Oxford Dictionary says a particular truth known by direct observation as opposed, as, as opposed to what is merely inferred, a datum of experience. Is 
something more than a deduction or a conclusion or an inference. It's something solider. So the idea of convergence and collaboration, promoting convergence in biomedical science, has been put forward in this paper by uh, Philip Sharp and Bob Langer. Multiple, multidisciplinary thinking and analysis permit emergence of new scientific principles. Hmm. His point is that if you cut across the silos, develop collaborations, have think tanks amongst a variety of people with different viewpoints, you'll get to a new state where sharing and the skeptical of viewing of each other's things allows you to get new ideas. If you have a one emphasis that NIH has, has, has been good at is bring, trying to bring together people from dis different disciplines. The Burroughs Welcome Fund with this uh, careers of the scientific interface does likewise, bringing people from mass physics, chemistry into biology. All of this, in a way, goes back to uh, John Platt's 1964 paper, Strong Inference. His inference cycle, you're probably all familiar with this, but it says, don't just have an hypothesis, have an alternative hypothesis. Devise the experiment that distinguishes between these two hypotheses and that means taking into account the noise in the data, design the experiment that goes better than the data noise, carry out the experiment, get a clean result, and you have surely refuted at least one of the, of the hypotheses and therefore advanced up the next step of the staircase of development of science. Reproducing the science isn't so easy. You can do that experiment can it be reproduced? And what do you need to reproduce? So this is where I'll spend most of my time. You need to reproduce the data, models, the modeling process, the data analyses, and just reproducing those is difficult. Uh, but the models are the building blocks. We should capture the development of those models, like the diagram of the phylogenetic tree of a model by Niederer and Smith, we need to see the evolution of those models. Sometimes there are mutations in that model sequence. Some of them are errors that get propagated through a generation, several generations of models in certain cases. And those, those have been documented where uh, an error in a parameter went through seven layers of models over, over 15 years and remained there unexamined until Aha, uh -huh. some insightful person decided to go over the whole works. More complex models describe more biology, but they put higher demands on the verification and validation measures. Big models of biochemical systems and systems biology are excruciatingly difficult to to characterize numerically and prove that they are even running correctly. It's harder yet to validate those models without a huge wealth of data. But having the models and the data together uh, is the critical thing. And it becomes even more critical as the complexity of the models increases. Reproducibility the capability and the computability uh, um, aid the aid experiment design and allow model improvement. So the modeling allows one to reconcile disparities uh, between diverse data sets, uh, some decision making, and some places for making error. That broadens the factual basis, improves the predictability uh, uh, of the model, and even so, we retain our um, thetica skepsis. This is a term that uh, I like. Uh, Thomas Henry Huxley took it from, from Goethe to resent thetica skepsis, your active doubt. And so that's, 
that I propose to you is your duty for this lecture to raise your active doubt and refute what I'm saying where you need to and where you want to. If you have a model that makes predictions, then you can evaluate it with respect to validation. You can do the experiment that it projects and thereby uh, refute the model if it doesn't verify. So invalidation is dis allows di or disproof of the hypothesis by the next experiment really creates the setting for the advancement of science. So we need to have those data, those so-called uh, validating experiments archived, the models archived in great detail so that the process can be evaluated and the next phase of the iterative process of science uh, undertaken. Hmm. So right now we have some very interesting developments in model preservation. These are in the form of uh, SBML by the systems biology community, a CellML by the more physiological community. CellML is, uh, comes out of Peter Hunter's lab in Auckland, New Zealand, and Paul Nielsen, who is here, here, both of whom are here at the meeting. And these are serious attempts uh, toward public sharing of models. They have a repository. The model has been curated. They represent uh, the output from papers which have been published. They've, incurred the, uh, they've improved the curation processes, and uh, so most of these models can be downloaded into various, uh, uh, they're, not, they're, they're an archival form of the model, a markup language, and they're downloaded into then computational engines to give solutions. They don't do everything. Uh, they provide a description of the model, of the equations, and of the representation of the system. What they don't give is below the red line. The, the markup languages do not provide the following elements that are really essential for complete uh, study. They don't give the heritage of the model, the relationships and derivations, but they are in certain cases uh, provided as an aside from the markup uh, ML form of the model. They need to explain the model configuration, relationship to the experiments. They need, they, we need the derivation of the math uh, and the relationship of the mathematical development to the published papers. All the references, the methods of solution. These are not in the markup language. The, uh, the SBML, CellML, uh, solve ODEs, but not, but not PDEs. You, they don't give you a markup of what, how you would examine the model and determine its behavior. But there is a new uh, advancement in the form of SED ML, uh, SED ML, uh, uh, which is a uh, simulation experiment that then gives you an exploration of the model behavior. SETML will then be uh, use CellML and SBML as source languages and give you a particular experiment. So it's a step up, but it doesn't really valid. It's not set up for validating against data. So this this list of things says we need to do more, and we need to find vehicles for doing that more. Here's my list of technical requirements for reproducibility. Here's where I invite your active doubt most specifically. What else do we need? What's not here? So we need processes defining the reproducible uh, modeling that go beyond the original intellectual beginnings. And these are basically technical. Adherence to standards. Uh, use common ontologies, so the names are known and recognizable from program to program. We want to build toward automated uh, module construction of multi-modular models, multi-scale and 
monoscale. So we need the ontologies. We want to have a complete description of the model with the diagrams, with, with its heritage, all the equations, and so on. The mathematics of a model can't be verified unless you run solutions. So that the technical requirement is that there be solutions that match the math and demonstrate the matching of the um, solutions with the mathematical expectation. It uses a conservation tests, tests against analytic solutions, and that one can archive the data um, with the models. So a model also needs an operations manual if it's uh, uh, any, in any way complex. We need to interpret the parameter values and look at the confidence limits and publish everything fully and openly. So the project file concept, uh, is, which is, I, I want to make the project file general and I'll give you a specific example. But here we want to preserve all of the experimental data sets, the model itself, its design, its diagrams, equations, the code, and so on, the numerical methods, the optimizers, the sensitivity analysis, uh, have notes for describing the analyses and the, and, and, the, and the interpretations of those, and to have plots of the output. Other features that should be in there for uh, the uses of reviewers and readers, the source code, and it should be editable so they can change it and, with their active doubt and try see if an alternative would be better. Um, use automated unit balance checking. Uh, sometimes inferring units is, is advisable, uh, is expedient, uh, has some source, it creates a source of error though. Um, the models should uh, allow you complete behavioral analysis from the point of view of parameter adjustment and, and sp spanning parameter space to see how, whether it's consistently computable in different regions of parameter space. Um, we say, have a look at the text. Java is, is in our basis for doing things. Um, and because it's general. So these, these kinds of things are in our uh, JSIM project file. Uh, JSIM is a, is a product of auto, from, from our lab that's now being ge fairly generally used in the, in the physiome community. Um, it's based on the project file and it handles uh, SPML, CellML, and the basic uh, mathematical modeling language of JSIM. It's open source. Um, its archival forms are MathML and XMML. And the model project file contains the kinds of things that we have just been discussing. So it allows you to set up the uh, numerical experiment to analyze the data, to evaluate that analysis of the data, and to draw your conclusions from that data, the experiment, the data, the modeling analysis, and the result of putting all of those ideas together. So the first step of, of, of having configured a model is to verify that you actually can compute it correctly. So you have to look at the equations to see if they're balanced and do then the standard things to look at limiting cases, to look at insensitivity to time step changes, space step, and so on. These are standard methods of verification. It's never 100% guaranteed to be correct. Numerical methods are always variant on different machines with different word lengths and so on. One thing that we found very valuable and is, is being taken up by uh, both CellML and SBML is error detection uh, in units. So unit balance expressions is, is a key part of the system. Make sure that what's on the left hand of equal sign is equal to the same units as what's on the right hand side, and of course within phrases for exponentiation and so on. So that's the first check. And automated unit balance checking 
is a, uh, a feature of a, a parser compiler combination and saves a lot of work and a lot of energy in making sure that the thing is correct. So now I'm going to take a, a brief excursion through a particular example project. And it's, an, it's a black box project. Uh, give it an input and look at the output and analyze the innards of the black box. This particular one uses isolated hearts, uh, injects a set of tracers into the inflow, collects a, uh, in a series of test tubes, our sample uh, sequence of samples at the outflow, does a lot of analysis through HPLC and isotope counting uh, to create then the concentration time curves at the outflow and then begins the analysis. In this particular case, we use a set of uh, iodinated albumin, which remains intravascular and marks the ex excursion from input to output through the vascular system. The L-glucose is an extracellular marker, so it escapes through the clefts between endothelial cells, enters the interstitium, and it's the marker for that space. And the D-glucose, then, is the one that we're interested in uh, determining its uptake and handling. So you think of a model between blood, so the upper box might be the blood, the vascular system, and the lower box, the interstitial fluid space where the, where the um, uh, L-glucose would go. And then that little arrow at the bottom would be the uptake into the, into the cells uh, that we want to measure and get the consumption of, of uh, D-glucose, the normal substrate. So here's an experiment there, the, uh, the, blue, the blue curve. Uh, and look at the left panel first, linear plot, concentration time as, uh, over 20 seconds. The blue curve is the albumin, high peak. Uh, the next the curve where the uh, symbols are on it are D-glucose and L-glucose, and they overlap at the peak, and they start to separate at the tail. That separation at the tail, uh, you can see at the, uh, uh, at the, at the right end, at the 20 seconds, they, they're separating. I, I, oh, yeah. So out here at the, at, the, at the tail, you can see the separation that represents the uptake of the D-glucose by the cardiomyocytes. So the, the, the model doesn't fit at all. If I go back to here, here's the, here's the model solution for the, for the D-glucose D and L-glucose, and it simply doesn't, doesn't fit the data. So you reject the two compartmental model. Those are stirred tanks, a lump compartmental analysis. So now we have to learn something. We look at the anatomy. We're going to use anatomic constraints to go the next step. The anatomy says the capillaries are long and skinny. They're 1,000 microns long, 5 microns diameter, and there's no way on Earth that they can be considered as mixing tanks. There's a gradient in, in concentration along the length of the capillary as, as material is taken up into the cells. So th these are 40, 40 micron arterial, uh, 80 micron are venules, and the capillary is about 5 microns in diameter and 1,000 diameters long, 1,000 microns long. So you look at this uh, then as a hex array of, of, uh, of capillary tissue units and uh, look at the convection diffusion relationships within them and you see that the gradients are standing. Now what happens at the, the tail of that curve, um, if I go back and run this, no, this is not working. The tail of it becomes exponential at a point when there's the steady state profile is 
stable, but not con it's not a uniform concentration. So I, I bring this make up make this point emphatically because many processes in biology are seen to have exponential tails on them and therefore they tend to get interpreted as being mix, mixing tanks, lumped compartmental models. Here's an example of a, has a perfect exponential tail and the fractional escape rate is a constant but the profile is anything but stable, is anything but constant. So. Don't get deceived by seeing an exponential and believing in it. Disbelieve. Okay, having that, that disbelief in it says, oh, for these kinds of models, you need to account for then the um, that heterogeneity of concentration along the length. And what that does for the model and the model solution is gives a better fit to the data. It's still not there, uh, either on the linear, pl linear plot or the semi-log plot. So what else is missing? Well, what we have known from other experiments that there is a great heterogeneity of flows in the normally functioning heart. Our hearts, as we sit here, monofunctional th thing that it is, has a heterogeneity of flows in different regions. And that needs to be accounted for. And in this particular experiment, you could understand that when you've got different, uh, here are the layers of, of fiber bundles within the heart, uh, that, and you can expect them to have different flows, they have different mechanics. Um, we measured in these experiments the, heter the heterogeneity flow by looking using microsphere depositions. And these are the probability density functions of regional flows uh, relative to the mean flow. So there were two sets of data acquired in these experiments. And we kind of said, let's use the average to guess at the one that goes with the, um, with the indicator elution study. So now taking that heterogeneity into account, we start to get reasonably good fits to the data. So in the left panel, you see the albumin uh, and the two glucoses uh, fitted well with the data. You can look at that on the right panel on the semi-log plot. You can see that all sets of data fit pretty well. These data are, are quite smooth. They've, they're all sampled in triplicate and gone through the the chemistry and the tracer counting uh, in triplicates. So we got really pretty clean data um, and it's demanding of the model to fit it. One way of looking at the goodness or badness of fits is to look at the residual differences. And uh, in this particular case, the, uh, the semi-log plot is part of it is shown above and the differences are shown below. There's just one, one point on the upslope of the curve where there's a substantial difference and the rest of them are pretty small. So there's a significant difference there that was simply due to that uh, basically one point. So, so uh, was that an error? It was in triplicate. So if you have some doubt about that point on the upslope, maybe the model is not even quite right there. The next thing you look at when you've got a set of estimates out of a model are what are the parameter values. So in here we measure the, the permeability surface area for L-glucose, uh, the uptake rate of D-glucose, the volume of the interstitial fluid space, the volume of the plasma, and the average flow over the heart is given that distribution. We get estimates. Aha, uh -huh. so th this, these, these estimates come out of the covariance matrix calculation. And so you get a value, a plus or minus one standard deviation or two standard deviations, whatever you like. Um, they come out of the, the covariance matrix gives you the, uh, from the Hessian, the local linear approximation to the sensitivity functions and uses those 
to, to uh, make these estimates of confidence limits. Don't trust them. They depend on the numbers of free parameters and they depend on that local linear approximation. They will not be the same if you're in a different part of state space. Well, there's another reason not to trust them. Take a look at the uh, so-called normalized covariance matrix. That's the correlation matrix shown in the bottom part. Uh, along the diagonals, that's relation of PS of L-glucose to PS of L-glucose and so on, the ones. So look at either the lower diagonals or the upper diagonal, it doesn't matter. Look for numbers with high correlation. In this case, there's one of 0.99, and of course, the other side of the matrix is the same number. So that indicates a high correlation between a pair of numbers, the flow and the vascular plasma volume. Well, if you're doing strictly one compartment analysis, you know those are exactly related reciprocally. So um, this says, get rid of one of those parameters. We'd actually measured the flow in the experiment, so we can get rid of it and put in the, the measured flow instead of estimating it. When you do that, now you've got much narrower confidence limits, and if you look at that correlation matrix, there are no high correlations amongst them. So this would be a better representation of the uh, accuracy and, and validity and separability of the estimates of the parameters. So, that, so you go through a series of, of things like this in terms of model reduction or model simplification in certain cases. In this case, it was just a model of, of uh, uh, getting, matter of getting rid of one unneeded parameter. So what do we get from, the, from this, doing this kind of experiment? We get an idea that the, we got an adequate model, gave good fit to the data, and it took iterative improvements. It used not just the physiological observations, but the anatomic observations. Now the technical point was that the project file for th that uh, was used for this analysis contains everything. It has the model, the analyses, the uh, optimizer setups, the sensitivity analysis, and the graphics, and of course the numerics. Different, there are different solvers available to check one against another. So scientifically, what we would say is that the glucose uptake by the cardiomyocytes is quantitatively measurement, measurable. We found that for the endothelial cells, there is no uh, detectable glucose, deglucose uptake. So that was a nice conclusion. So now, turning to the generality of this JSON project file, which may be regarded as a primitive example of what will be reproducible research, it really isn't there yet, but it provides archival storage. It, it's publicly available. It's free on the web. You can dial it up. Uh, oh, I didn't write it on here, but it's model number 126 on the, at that Physiom site. The modeling and analysis system itself is open source and can be downloaded. The coding is just the equations. It's easier than using C or Fortran or MATLAB, and much, much faster than MATLAB. The, with this kind of uh, package, you can set up and leave available for the users the behavior analysis, the modeling analysis of the data, and keep it all in the package. So uh, this package runs on Linux, uh, Macintosh, Windows, and translates into, um, um, well, in this particular case, because it's got PDEs in it, it doesn't translate into SBML and CellML, but uh, uh, it does translate to MATLAB. So the next part is, is discussion. How far can we go with this project file idea and the idea of reproducing physio models? So we can archive data sets. There are, should be open source. They're good for collaboration. People use these models, we find. And, but it's work in preparing them. Uh, a fully reproducible paper is a good start. Um, 
putting them in a public repository is takes some extra work. And it, it contains all the things we've talked about, but um, it does require care. But then it's available for everybody to build on. And the question is, shall we do it? The answer, my answer is, we shall do it because it should be required of us to do, make our science totally reproducible. The NSF have espoused that cause, as has NIH. Uh, they don't demand reproducibility yet, so it's only a question of time. Nor do journals demand reproducibility yet. Okay. Donahoe, Dave, this is David Donahoe at Sanford. He's been at this for 15 years. And um, here he says, if everyone in a research team knows that everything they do is going to be somewhere, going to someday be published for reproducibility, they will behave differently and do better work. Oh. It's a fundamental fact that in striving for reproducibility, uh, we're producing code for the use of strangers. Hmm. Strangers. We work in our lab. We do our stuff. Here's a stranger. Heave a brick at him. Mm -hmm. um, a stranger. Anyone not in possession of the author's current short-term memory and experience. You've all had this experience, I dare say, that uh, you find your co-author didn't quite know how you did it. Or the current graduate students well, most particularly future graduate students, they have no idea from a, just a normal publication. What about the new postdoc? Well, what about the referees? Can they tell what you really did? Your future employees. Well, how about me next year? I can't remember how I did it. Exactly. And you've all had that experience. You go back on something and you say, oh, oh, I got to restart. Restart time is really costly. <laughs> One of the ideas that comes out of this uh, from several sources are executable publications. There was an international conference uh, sponsored by ICCS last year, and Elsevier put out, out a special uh, paper on executable papers, a grand challenge. So three of these, I'm going to go through them. They're there for the... Uh, this, this pro uh, talk will be available so you can get those references. But one, the one from uh, Novikovsky was called the Collage Authoring Environment. The author, the smiling face with the beard, uh, goes two directions at once. One is, one is to put on, on the collage server the um, they do the experiments and down in the, the, the arrow going to the bottom line is to publish the paper. And then, so those go, here I've got, where, where's my thing? So he's going this direction to collage, this direction to publish, and then they link up in the final computing back end so that the paper reproduces each of the original figure going through the computations at the time. Not just giving the printout, but actually executing, uh, executing the code. Another one, uh, S Sebastian Lee uh, has called this the literate programming. Um, actually, he called, it, it the, he called the program Lepton. It's an automaton designed for the review and the reuse of computational results. Um, it has no pre-computed results in it, and it gives the full set of instructions for do reproducing the author's presentations and figures and analyses. He even wrote the paper in Lepton. Hmm, not bad. Here's another one from Mar Matan G uh, Garvish and, and David Donahoe. A universal, this is a little different from the executive paper. What, he, what he's saying is we need universal identifiers for computational results. Uh, they should in, include 
the a, a verifiable computational result, a VCR, a VCR repository, the database is needed, and an identifier, just a code, like a DOI. And so these three things together then provide an executable package that can be stored, identified in a repository, and reproduced. Is this worthwhile? And this is where we come back to discussion. Um, obviously, there's all altruistic motivation. Do a good job and uh, others can benefit from it. Um, okay, but we also contribute to open source publications, to data repositories, websites, etc. Uh-huh. We give away everything. That's our, that's our lab principle. We give away everything, even before publication. Um, and that's risky sometimes, or is thought to be. Not necessarily. Um, we've done that with all of our technologies and our, our LS counting facility and so on. So let's be selfish about it, though. If we do a good job, then we do reproducible work, and it raises the caliber of training in the lab, raises the standard for postdocs, Postdocs are there for a short time, and they're looking for high-yield stuff uh, to move their careers, whereas graduate students, they, they can succumb to pressure more readily and do reproducible work. Um, but if you do reproducible work, it improves the ratings on the grant proposals. In a social sense, in a communal sense, we encourage, this is encouraged collaborations. It makes practical collaboration is very practical and um, it pushes your collaborators to do equally re reproducible work. Is it worth it for society? The old story. One builds on the shoulders of giants. And when I think of Nobel Prize winners like uh, uh, Hans Krebs or the um, Hodgkin and Huxley, their work was reproducible. You can reproduce every figure in the Hodgkin Huxley 1952D paper from the paper. And um, they didn't give the code, but it's close enough. They gave the right equations. Um, nowadays, with more complicated things than Hodgkin Huxley, you need more code and you need to ex execute it with known uh, um, solvers. So, that's the source code idea. Now, in a, whoops, we're a skeptical society nowadays. Uh, so if I have a clearly defined concept to argue against, that's the first step. And that's what the reproducible objective is. If we can reduce a model from an open source publication and repository and websites and so on, and give it to somebody else, that may save them months to years. Many people have struggled sometimes, I know for many months, to reproduce advanced electrophysiological models. Nowadays, it's much easier. Uh, both CellML and SBML are a source of a wealth of electrophysiology models, an area of quite advanced uh, uh, computing. So what shall we do for modeling reproducibility? Best standards and practices. Uh, fit, there are a set of standards for models that are not, not generally accepted and, and, and uh, need revision, and, uh, but worthwhile trying to establish that set so they serve as a beginning. We need, repo we need national repositories um, for data, the best current national repository for data, experimental data, uh, is um, a PhysioNet uh, at Harvard MIT with uh, Ari Goldberger and George Moody and, and, and uh, Roger um, Mark. It doesn't have physical chemical data. We need uh, data on the, the properties of vascular walls or nerve sheaths or you can think of a hundred thousand other things that 
where we need data in order to understand the mechanics and physiological performance of, of those pieces of tissue. We need models and we need toolkits, simulation systems, and the executable paper idea is a good one. We need to persuade scientific societies, that includes the EMBS uh, and the EMBS journals, to upgrade their review systems so they require reproducibility for publication. That isn't here yet, it's going to be some time away. But at the same time, one could anoint certain papers as having fulfilled the requirements for reproducibility. And that will strengthen the system and force others to upgrade to that level. If that also raises the citation index, David Donahoe's case is that for WaveLab out of Stanford, uh, raised their uh, citation rate magnificently over a period of a decade. Um, so, maintaining your active doubt, does the reproducible package store concepts in a concrete in a way, and does this inhibit development? Are we going to try to cast things in bronze, or continue to regard these things as merely stepping stones that are transients? It's that latter view that's important. There's some cost. Is this good for training? Hmm. Will the Promotions Committee recognize reproducibility as an asset? Well, those are the ideas. I'll leave you, leave you with these things to think about. And um, in the meantime, I want to thank my, my colleagues for their work and their contribu contributions to this particular talk. Um, JSIM is uh, Eric Butterworth's uh, domain of, and uh, um, been an immense organizer for that. The uh, one point at the bottom one to, to Max Neal, particularly as he is developing the, the on, relationship between the ontologies and the models, very important. So we have a nice group at the University of Washington here on a sunny day. Doesn't always rain. And thank you very much for the pleasure of being here and, and uh, trying out these ideas on you. Uh, we um, are uh, at the point where uh, this session is uh, coming to an end, but we would like to take a uh, couple of questions, if there are some, for our speaker. Um, I cannot see very well, but if there are some questions, please step up to the microphone to ask the question of our speaker. Uh, yes, are you familiar with the unified modeling language? or also known as UML. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not, I'm not hearing you yet. Uh, are you familiar with a unified modeling language, also known as UML? It was um, produced by a group called the Object Management Group. Oh. No, I'm not familiar with it. I've, I've heard about it. I, I have not in, in, inspected it. Tell us more. Um, it's. I believe it meets most of your criteria. And there are tools out there. Some of the tools are actually free and open source. Uh, unfortunately, the best tool that I think would meet all of your requirements is uh, a tool that IBM owns. It's uh, their rational uh, family of products. And like I said, the, those tools are proprietary, but the uh, modeling language from the OMG is definitely open, available. There's books about how to do it. <clears throat> Actually, yesterday there was a tutorial here about the language that was excellent. Um, so and I would be glad to talk to you more about it afterwards. 
No, I, I'd be very interested in learning about that, and and it'd be interesting to see if they could be provoked to making the toolkit uh, open source as well. The combination would be really powerful. Um, well, I don't know how altruistic IBM is. Sometimes they they, they can be very kind. <laughs> They, uh, and it is actually the result of the collaboration of four of the best modeling minds in the country. They fought yeah. with each other for years and finally said, we're tired of fighting, let's get together and make this unified. Uh, it's, it's used throughout the military, it's used throughout the computer community. Um, yeah. So. Uh, yeah, I'll talk oh, to you later. That's, that, that's, that's, that, but that's Thank very you. interesting to hear. One of, the, one of the groups that has been, in terms of advanced modeling and bringing together a communal approach to trying to model is the defense community. And, and so that's, uh, uh, that's a parochial community that doesn't easily give its stuff to others, but it's on the way. Uh, DARPA was instrumental. Uh, it was the object management group, which is open, that does it, but they were highly uh, subsidized by DARPA. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Uh, is there any other question? Uh, before we let you go, I would like to solicit your brief comments on uh, the importance of uh, models and modeling in general, since this is one of our common interests, of course, uh, both for scientific advancement and also for the medicine of the future. Well, I, I, th I think I, my, my general answer to that is that the model is an expression of an hypothesis that is exact pre and precise. It's expressed in mathematical form and therefore clear and definitive that lends itself to being refuted. Uh, verbal descriptions of a situation are not readily refuted because they cannot be expressed so, so explicitly as to be denied. So I think that's a fundamental reason for using the modeling. The modeling already resolves many disparities between data sets or points of view and um, if it doesn't, hasn't resolved those things, it isn't an explicit model. So I think it's just, it's just, it's a, it's a marking stone. Thank you, thank you very much. So I would like to um, uh, once again thank our speaker for the very thoughtful and inspiring comments and suggestions. Thank you. Thank you.